let me talk about, this is about 10 years out of date, but, but nevertheless, I don't think it's, um, it's still not a bad gloss. So work on distributed computing and you know, on cryptography has really assumed that divided agents into two sets. There's the good guys and the bad guys. The good guys follow the protocol. They do what they're supposed to do. And the bad guys do all they can to subvert it. And that made a lot of sense historically that the system designer writes a protocol, but some computers might be flaky and not do what they're supposed to do. There might be an active adversary who doesn't do what they're supposed to do. So this model was meant to be a worst case kind of thing. Um, but people made a lot of progress using this. And you know, I suspect all of you have heard of things like Byzantine Agreement that was sort of very much motivated by this model. Um, by way of contrast, game theory assumes that all agents are rational. No good guys or bad guys, just rational agents. And they're trying to maximize their utility. And to me, most, both views make sense in different contexts and, and we wanna combine them. So let me give you some intuition. So uh, as I said, Byzantine agreement is the paradigmatic problem in distributed computing. So for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, there's N soldiers up to T of them may be faulty. Uh, N and T are common knowledge. Uh, each agent starts with their initial preference. Actually, what I'm giving you is the consensus version of it. Um, and the, we want an algorithm that, that followed by all the non-faulty guys guarantees that all the non-faulty guys do the same thing at the same time. So they either all attack or retreat or all retreat. And if the soldiers are all non-faulty and their initial preferences are identical, that's what they do. So this is the second clause is a way of presenting the, preventing the trivial solution where no matter what, everybody attacks. Of course, if everybody attacks, then that guarantees that all the non-faulty guys do the same thing. So we just put on this minimal requirement that if everybody initially wanted to retreat and they're all non-faulty, then they should end up retreating. You can't just take the trivial algorithm of everybody attacking. So, um, and just to briefly review, just as it's gonna come up later, there's a ton of work, hundreds of papers on business agreement. And one of the things they considered is what kind of faulty behavior do you have? Byzantine failures allow you to do anything. You can lie and cheat and steal. And then we know, <coughs> excuse me, agree agreement is possible if n is greater than 3t, where t, just to remind you again, uh, up to t might be faulty. So t is an upper bound on the number of faulty agents. With crash failures, agreement is always possible. With Byzantine failures, again, Byzantine means you, it's arbitrary crash failures, uh, are failures where if you're faulty, you have the good sense to shut up and die. So you don't lie, you always tell the truth, you always follow the protocol, perhaps up to a certain point where you crash. That's why they're called crash failures. At the point where you crash, you might send out some messages and then crash. Um, and it's known that agreement when possible is reachable in T plus one rounds, T plus one is a lower bound. So there's just a ton of work on this. Now, if you look at this from a game theorist point of view, Byzantine agreement is a game between two teams of unknown composition. There's the good guys and the bad guys. We know there's the most T bad guys, but we don't know who they are. So it's a game and we can write down a utility function. So that's one thread. I wanna relate it to a second thread, um, which goes back to the eighties, uh, multi-party computation. That's a paradig paradig paradigmatic problem of cryptography. And the picture here is that each agent has a secret input. Their goal is to compute some function of that input without revealing any information other than the output. So you wanna know everybody has a salary, that's their secret input. You want to know what is the highest salary being paid. So you want to know the max. Uh, so the function is the max function. And you wanna compute the max without revealing any information about each individual player's salary, right? So that the picture you should have and that they very much did have explicitly in these early papers is imagine you had a trusted third party, a trusted mediator. So each agent can send that trusted mediator their salary and the mediator will tell everybody what the highest salary is, right? Um, but somehow you want to do this without having a trusted third party. That's the goal. And there are protocols for multi-party computation, assuming that less than half or less than a third of the agents are bad. So this one third 
I should remind you of this. Again, we can do business agreement if less than a third of the agents are bad. It's not a fluke and it's very much the same model. Um, so let me talk a bit more about mediators. So consider an auction where people do not want to bid publicly. So why don't they want to bid publicly? Well, public bidding reveals useful information, right? So if you're bidding for the rights to drill for oil, um, I guess these days that's not such a hot area to bid in anymore, but certainly, you know, 10 years ago, there was a lot of bidding on that. You don't want to reveal to other companies where you're hoping to drill, right? I mean, if you bid a lot for a certain site, presumably that's because your geologists have looked at that site carefully and figured that's a good place to, to be drilling for oil. You don't want that information to, uh, to leak out. So again, if there were a trusted third party, we'd be all set that, that everybody could tell the trusted third party what their bid is and the trusted third party would just reveal who won, who bid the highest, right? So, um, and again, Byzantine agreement can be solved easily with a mediator if n is greater than 2t, it's trivial. Each player tells the mediator, mediator his preference. The mediator chooses the majority. Um, so that leads me to my third thread, work on implementing mediators. In a sense, you can view all the work in cryptography in the 80s um, as really work on, on implementing mediators. Can we, and what they meant by implementing the mediator is can we get a protocol that has the same effect as if there were a trusted mediator that is precisely nobody knows anything other than the function's output. Now in game theory, this was made quite explicit. Um, they talked about implementing mediators. Now they were looking at it in the context of game theory with Nash equilibrium. So technically what they had in mind is there are three games. There's what I'm gonna call the underlying game. It's a normal form game. What I mean by that is everybody makes a move. Uh, you have a matrix that describes the payoff as a function of everybody's move. Everybody gets a payoff. Then there's a game with the mediator. In the game with the mediator, you can use the mediator. Uh, you can talk to the mediator. They might tell you stuff. But uh, after talking to the mediator, you again make a move, just like in the underlying game, and your payoffs are the same as the underlying game, right? So the picture is it's, it's think that there's an underlying game, but now we can use a mediator to maybe help us achieve better results than we could on our own in the underlying game. And for those of you who are familiar with notions like correlated equilibrium, you can think of a correlated equilibrium as what you can get with the mediator where you don't even have to talk to the mediator, the mediator just tells you what to do. Um, so you can definitely in general achieve more with a mediator than you can achieve without it. Again, those of you who know correlated equilibrium is, um, with a mediator, you can get a correlated equilibrium in general, Correlated equilibria include Nash equilibria, but, but are more general, and you can't achieve a correlated equilibrium without a mediator. So definitely having a mediator can help. And the question the economists asked, they looked at a third game. So the first game was the underlying normal form game. The second game is the game with the mediator. The third game is what they call the communication game, where players are just talking to each other, which should remind you an awful lot of the work on, on, on multi-party computation. Um, so they asked, can we achieve the same result, the same Nash equilibrium as we got with the mediator just by talking to each other using what the economists call cheap talk? Uh, the reason it was called cheap talk is, you know, I can look, I can promise you really for sure, I'm going to make this move, I'm going to go left. It's cheap talk. If I don't do it, you can't do anything. It's not like there's a judge that can force me to do it. Um, so, and notice also the dates here mid to late 80s, not so different from the dates here. Um, and the kinds of results they got, so I, I just stressed, this is almost identical to multi-party communication. Certainly, if you look at the papers, uh, they're talking about mediators in both cases. If we had a trusted third party, if we can do something with a trusted third party, can we do it without the trusted third party? Um, the only difference, really, if you stand back a yard, or a meter, uh, is that in the game theory literature, the emphasis was on rational players rather than faulty players. So in the cryptography literature, we wanted to be able to get this result despite up to a third or up to a half of the guys being bad and trying to bring down the system. Um, 
Whereas in, in the game theory world, there's no good guys and bad guys, it's just rational guys. And we want to get the same Nash equilibrium using cheap talk that we got without it. And also in the game theory literature, there was no concerns about privacy, whereas this was a big deal in the, uh, in, in, in the multi-party communication literature. But interestingly, the game theory solutions provided secure, uh, provided privacy. It turned out that in order to get the results they wanted, they needed to keep things private. In any case, uh, the rest of this talk is about combining the threats. Um, so first, I want to start by generalizing the notion of Nash equilibrium. In a way, that's actually been done before. Um, I want to talk about K-resilient equilibrium. So Nash equilibrium tolerates deviations by one player. So for uh, Rajiv, is it fair for me to assume that everybody here knows Nash equilibrium? They wouldn't be coming to this talk otherwise? Yes, I think yeah, you can assume Okay. That. Uh, but yeah, I, I, have, I have a question about your previous slide, though. Sure. I think in, in the multi-party computation, there was a lot of uh, uh, efforts focused on looking at different functions. And I, yes. you know, so uh, in the case of um, this game theory literature, what kinds of functions were they considering? Was it similar? They weren't considering functions at all, technically. Yeah. Um, they had what they called the underlying game. So they started out with the normal form game and in both the um, game with the mediator and, and, and what they call the communication game, um, in, in the game with the mediator, you communicate with the mediator and then made a move in the underlying game. In the communication game, you communicated with each other and then made a move in the underlying game. And the payoffs were just the payoffs in the underlying game. Uh, okay. Right, so that to the extent that you wanted to talk about computing a function, that would only be true if uh, the underlying game in some sense captured the function, which you can imagine. So I, I should say that it, it was perfectly okay that they were actually interested in underlying games that were, were not, I said normal form games, they look more generally at Bayesian games where each player has a type. Uh, again, is it safe for me to assume that people know what a Bayesian game is? So think of a Bayesian game as, as a game where each player has some private information that's known as the player's type and, and their strategy can depend on their type. And typically it's assumed that, that there's a commonly known distribution over types. But I wanna to relate that to, to your question, Rajiv, that you can assume your type is your input to the function. And then you can assume that your action is the output of the function or something like that. So you could, in some cases, encode function computation. Certainly the input you can encode with the type. Right, so that the question is, can you somehow cleverly encode computing the output um, with with what the you know the player's actions in the game? In some cases, the answer is yes, but that certainly was not their focus on computing a function. So, okay. I mean, where I saw the the um, the similarity was both of them were talking about can you know if we can do something with a trusted third party, can we do it without? Okay. Um, so going back to where, are, are there other questions? I mean, this is definitely a good time to stop and ask. All right. Um, so as we said, Nash equilibrium tolerates deviations by one player. It's perfectly consistent with Nash equilibrium. The two players could do better by deviating, right? So we could have a Nash equilibrium where neither Rupak nor I could do better individually by deviating. But if Rupak and I got together and said, you know, said, hey, Rupak, you know, I have this great plan. If we both deviate, it's perfectly consistent with Nash equilibrium that we could do better. And we were certainly interested in cases where we had coalitions. So I'm gonna say an equilibrium is K resilient if no group of size K can gain by deviating in a coordinated way. So just a simple example, we can imagine a game where everybody plays either zero or one, that's your action. If everybody plays zero, then, then everybody gets a payoff of one. If exactly two players play one, they get a payoff of two and the rest get zero. And for any other set of actions, everybody gets zero. So I claim that playing, everybody playing zero is a Nash equilibrium. That should be clear. If everybody get, plays zero, they get one. And if one person deviates and plays a one, then, then we're in this bottom bullet here. Otherwise everybody gets zero. They're definitely, you know, the one person is definitely worse off by deviating. But if Rupak and I got together and agreed that we would both play one, 
then that deviation would make us happy. We would get two and everybody else would get zero. So this is an example of a Nash equilibrium that's not too resilient. It does not tolerate deviations by coalitions of size two. And, and I, I hope I don't really have to work too hard to convince you that, that in a lot of real world settings, it makes sense to consider K resilient equilibria for not too large K. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine a thousand people getting together to coordinate, but I can certainly imagine five or six people getting together to coordinate, especially if there's large stakes involved. Um, so in general, K-resilient equilibria don't exist, which might be one of the people, uh, one of the reasons rather that game theorists never really looked at it carefully. Game theorists tend to avoid, avoid like the play, looking at solution concepts that aren't guaranteed to exist. And it's not too hard to come up with examples where even two resilient equilibria don't exist. So um, historically back in 1959, even Bob Alman considered what he called strong equilibria. And these are um, equilibria that are K resilient for all K. And there has been a bit of work on it after that, uh, but we were more interested not in the case of K resilient for all K, but we think of K as a parameter and we're gonna be interested in equilibria that are resilient, you know, three resilient, where K is three. Um, and I think that's important, but I would argue that K resilience does not give us everything we want. Let me explain. Um, so I want to also consider irrational players, players that don't seem to respond to incentives, maybe because their utilities are not what we thought they were, maybe because they're irrational, maybe because their computer, computers are being flaky, right? So that, that um, I don't want to count on everybody's computer working well um, you know, on, if I'm doing bidding, right? If I'm doing bidding over the, over the internet for, some, for something, can I assume that everybody's computer is, is working well? Maybe somebody's, somebody's computer is mangling their results. These things happen. So we get behavior that's not consistent with the protocol, not because somebody is deviating because they're rational and they think they're gonna be better off with that deviation. Um, maybe they're deviating because their computers are faulty or, or because the network is being flaky or because so typically when we analyze protocols, we think we understand what players' utilities are. But if you think about 9-11, so were the people who flew into World Trade Center, were they irrational? Well, um, you know, we can debate that, but you could make a case that, that they were being perfectly rational given their utility function. It's just that the utility function is not what you thought it was, right? So um, apparently irrational behavior is certainly not uncommon. Uh, people share on, on, on sites and they see it on BitTorrent and so on. Um, so is that really irrational? You know, I mean, I back in the old days when, when people were downloading stuff, music on the web, those of us who remember, you might say, well, um, you could say it's irrational to post music on the web and let people download it. You might get sued. And besides that, you know, you might need a big server just to handle all the requests. But nevertheless, people did it. Although it turned out relatively few people did it. Um, but you know, maybe their utility function was such that it makes me feel good that all that music that you're playing, that came from me, right? So that, that you know, uh, we shouldn't presume that we understand people's utility functions. And the key point here is that if we're designing a protocol, we might want robustness. That is, we might want the protocol to work despite the fact that there's some players who have utilities that are not what we expect, or despite the fact that some players might have faulty computers or don't understand the rules and so act apparently in an irrational way just because they don't understand what's going on. So imagine we have a group of end bargaining agents. If they all stay and bargain, everybody gets two. If anybody goes home, the person who goes home gets one, but the people who stay get zero. Right. So I claim there are two Nash equilibria in this game. Quick sanity check. What are the two equilibria? Clearly, everybody's staying to bargain is an equilibrium. They all get two. That's that's Pareto optimal. And what's the other equilibrium? Let me encourage audience participation here. There is another equilibrium in this game. Somebody? 
everyone goes home. Everybody goes home, exactly. Right? Because if everybody goes home, they all get one. And if anybody deviates, the deviator gets zero. Right? Now, everybody's staying and getting two. That's a K-resilient equilibrium. No coalition of size K for any K has any incentive to deviate, right? Because if you, a coalition of size K and you deviate, then you get zero. Certainly no benefit to that. On the other hand, um, it's a very fragile equilibrium because all it takes is one irrational player. And I put irrational in quotes. You know, maybe you have a sick child and, and you decide that you're not going to stay because you need to go home to take care of your child, right? So you have utilities that are maybe not what I expect, but, uh, or maybe you didn't understand, you didn't get the message that you were supposed to stay in bargain and you went home. So this is a very fragile equilibrium in the sense of all it takes is one, let me say irrational, but I don't really mean irrational. I mean, it might be perfectly rational. All it takes is one player who doesn't stay and then all the people who stay get zero. On the other hand, everybody going home, the other equilibrium, is incredibly robust. I don't care who deviates. Sure, they don't have to, you know, they can go to stay in bargain. I'm gonna get one no matter what they do. So when I say robust here, it's because my payoff is not affected by what other players do. Does that make sense? So uh, we're gonna introduce another notion that we call immunity. Uh, a, a protocol is T immune if the payoffs of the good agents are not affected by the actions of up to T other agents. Again, T is a parameter. So um, I claim this, everybody going home is T immune for any T because I get my one no matter what the other players do. Right, does that make sense? So this equilibrium, everybody staying is K resilient, but not even one immune. This equilibrium turns out to be both K resilient and T immune for all K and T less than it. Uh, I, I have a question. I, I assume the answer is no, but even if, so suppose you were to focus only on socially optimal equilibria, the same phenomena would uh, arise? Uh, if you had multiple equilibria, yeah, they might not all be um, equally good from the point of view of robustness. Right, that, that um... yeah, but I mean, no, but there is this whole thing about you know these the social uh, socially optimal things, and then I mean that uh, which is a subset of all the Nash equilibria, right? Right. And, so and you, you can look at you can look at the equilibria that maximize social welfare. Yeah. Right. That, um, that's another desiderata. It's orthogonal to the two that I've outlined here, right? right? So that you can have something that's socially optimal, but not robust. Um, you can have something that's robust and not socially optimal and so on. So clearly in terms of social optimality, that's this equilibrium, everybody's staying, right. right? But it's very fragile. And if you had a large group of people, so imagine you had a thousand people and to get the payoff of two required everybody to stay. Would you be so comfortable in, in assuming that everybody would stay? Or would you go home and, and you know, get your guaranteed payoff of one and not have to worry about what other people are doing, right? So um, uh, they're just different desiderata. Right, okay, yeah. So I'm formally going to define a KT robust equilibrium as one that tolerates coalitions of size K and up to T irrational players. So it's, it's uh, I, I'm not gonna write down the formal definition here, in the formal definition, we even allow the um, T players to, to collaborate with the, uh, with the coalition. So to be KT robust, even if you had a coalition of size K plus T, you don't do better. But again, the intuition here is no coalition of size K can do better by deviating. So these K, K guys care about payoffs. They're rational. On the other hand, these T guys, might not be influenced by payoffs at all, right? Or at least if they are, they, you don't understand their utilities. So to say that we're KT robust, it's saying 
No matter what these K guys do, they can't do better by deviating. No matter what these T guys do, my payoff doesn't get hurt if they deviate. So let me stress the difference with K resilience. We're doing just the standard generalization of Nash equilibrium. We're saying these K guys cannot benefit by deviating. With T robustness, we're saying, I don't get hurt if they deviate. I'm not saying they, they may or may not benefit for deviating. Uh, in, intuitively, it's because I don't know anything about their utilities. They're strange, irrational, who knows? I just wanna make sure that I don't get hurt if they deviate, right? So that's the intuition here. This is two to zero rata. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't want it to be beneficial for a group of K to deviate, and I don't wanna be hurt if T players deviate. So, so, sorry, there's a question. So these T players act separately or can they also coordinate? Uh, in our definition, they can coordinate and that comes out in our definition. And they can even coordinate with, with these K players. If you look carefully at the definition, that's effectively what it's saying. Um, so the question we're going to ask, so in general, KT robust equilibria don't exist, but they can be obtained with the help of mediators. Uh, you can think of Byzantine agreement as a zero T robust equilibrium. Uh, can a KT robust equilibrium be obtained? So the question we're going to ask is if you can get a KT robust equilibrium with a mediator, can you get it without the mediator? Can you get rid of the mediator? So this is, I'm hoping this should remind you of the kind of thing that was going on in multi-party computation. If you can do something with a trusted third party, can you do the same thing without? And also implementing mediators here. The generalization, um, so if you like, the, the econ literature was asking the same question in the case that k equals one and t equals zero. And there's a sense in which you can view the crypto literature, the multi-party computation literature is asking this question in the case that k equals zero, because they weren't concerned about uh, utilities. They didn't have a notion of rational agents. So there's a sense in which we're generalizing both the uh, multi-party computation literature and, and certainly generalizing the game theory literature on implementing mediators. So here are typical results. Uh, I'll, I'll say a bit if I have time at the end about the, I think I will, about the techniques we use, but uh, suppose there's a KT robust equilibrium, uh, a KT robust protocol that's an equilibrium with the mediator. Can you get rid of the mediator? And the answer is yes. If N is greater than three K plus three T or three K plus T, and this is true even if exact utilities aren't known. And the protocol turns out to be bounded. That is, it runs in 17 steps. You know, some there is an upper bound in the number of steps. And, and I guarantee you that after that bounded number of steps, um, it'll stop. And it doesn't require punishment. I'll, I'll talk about punishment in a second. So let me say what was known before we came on the scene. In the econ literature going back to 89, they had shown that, that Nash equilibrium is implementable if N is at least four. So you can think why four? Well, four is three times one plus one, right? So, so what they showed was the special case of this result when K is one and T is zero. And that, that was certainly known uh, from the paper by Barney and, and Forge uh, back in 89. Interestingly, so let me talk, say a few words about punishment strategy. So intuitively, a punishment strategy says, if I catch you deviating, then I can punish you. So there is something that the good players can do to make the deviating players worse off than they would have been had they not deviated. So I'm, not, I'm gonna skip the formal definition of a punishment strategy. Uh, the original notion of punishment strategy is Dutel Hanan Ben Porat, who's a game theorist. So we're using that here and saying, look, if there's a punishment strategy, Technically, there has to be a way to punish up to the up to K players if enough of the good guys implement the punishment strategy, then the K players will be worse off than they would have been if they'd followed the protocol. So uh, now we can do it. So this is an improvement. Here was 3K plus 3T. Now we're down to 2K plus 3T. Um, if there's a punishment strategy, we can implement the mediator if N is greater than 2K plus 3T. Interestingly, this protocol randomizes and the randomization is over the running time. So basically you're tossing a coin to decide whether or not to stop at any given round. 
I'll, I'll say more about that later if I have time. So the expected running time is finite, but it, there can be unbounded runs, right? I mean, it's possible a coin always lands tails and you'll run an unbounded amount of time. I'm stressing this because as you'll see, we have counterexamples to results in the econ literature because of this. Um, if there's a broadcast channel, you can do better. You can get it down to 2K plus 2T, but now there'll be an epsilon error. That is to say, uh, you'll implement the mediator in with probability one minus epsilon, and with probability epsilon, you won't implement the mediator. And if you have one-way functions and there's a punishment strategy, you can do it if K plus T is less than N. So what, what we found interesting here is these are standard assumptions from the distributed computing and cryptography literature, right? The existence of a broadcast channel is something that is not always, but certainly sometimes assumed in the distributed computing world. That turned out to make a big difference here. One-way functions is something that, that the cryptographers often assume. Uh, and again, that made a huge difference here. And roughly speaking, and as I say, if I have more time at the end, uh, the idea here is we're, we're gonna reduce this to multi-party computation and secret sharing. I'll, I'll say a lot more about that. Uh, if I have time at the end. So it turned out, particularly for this result, this result really followed from results on multi-party computation that said you could do multi-party computation if n is greater than 3t. So it turned out that we, we had to do a bit of work to adapt the result, but basically the techniques used in the cryptography literature suffice, you know, were what we used to get this result. So in some sense, we can go to the economists and say, uh, you know, we can explain to you why you got the n greater than four, and it's really an instance of a much more general result. And you really need to learn some cryptography to, to really understand how to do that. I mean, it turns out that, uh, let me say a few words here, that, that, that roughly uh, in the end, we're going to do secret sharing. So it's, we have a polynomial. And the question is, if you have a certain number of points on the polynomial, can you reconstruct the polynomial? And it turns out that, that if you have um, so ignoring the T that, that, that roughly speaking, if you, if you have, so think about a line. Uh, if you have three players, one of whom is faulty, then you can see that, you know, when they tell you what their values are, you'll see that they, they might not be collinear, but you can't figure out what the right answer ought to be. But if you have four players, one of whom is faulty, even if one of them is, and, and each of them are telling you, their secret is a point on the line. We're using secret sharing. And their secret is a point on the line. If each of you are telling their point what their point is on the line, even if the bad player lies, you'll have three collinear points. You'll be able to reconstruct the line. A generalization of that argument is that's where we use the secret sharing. You know, when I said we reduce it to secret sharing, uh, that's what we're doing here. We're able to get the n greater than 3k plus t result. The 3k plus t is if you give me enough points in the line, on, on, on the polynomial of, of whatever degree, I can reconstruct the polynomial. That's what's going on here. So in some sense, we could say to the economist, that really is at the heart of your n greater than four, n greater than or equal to four protocol, um, even though it might not be obvious. Now, uh, um, anyway, there's matching lower bounds. This is really the best we can do in general. So if n is less than or equal to 3k plus t, 3k plus t, or 3k plus 3t, then there is a game um, and a kt robust strategy with a mediator that can't be implemented without a mediator, um, without knowing the utilities or, the, or without having a punishment strategy. So notice what this is saying. We're saying for every single game, for every single underlying game, if you can get a kt robust uh, equilibrium with the mediator, you can get it without, if n is greater than 3k plus 3t. And the lower bound says there is a game where there's an equilibrium that you can get with the mediator that you cannot implement if n is less than or equal to 3k plus 3t. And likewise for all the other results. And some of these proofs use ideas from Byzantine agreement for getting lower bounds in Byzantine agreement. So this is really distributed computing stuff going on here. Uh, let me say a few words about running time. So it turns out that if 2k plus 2t is greater than or equal to n, 
there's a game that has a KT robust strategy with the mediator that can't be implemented by any deterministic cheap talk strategy. So you have to randomize. So when I say here that the protocol is randomized, well, it actually has to be randomized. Um, for all B, there's a game with a mediator that can't be implemented with expected running time less than or equal to B. So I can force you to run arbitrarily long. And similarly, if, if, um, um, if you're allowing epsilon error, then you can get a, a similar result. Now, why am I focusing on these results? Um, well, stay tuned. Uh, let me just say a few words about asynchrony before, before I go on. That all these results assume that systems are synchronous, right? Players communicate to each other and then all make a decision in the same round. So the round says, I send a message, then you receive it, then you take an action. Any message sent in round T will be received in round T, right? Um, but, and in all these protocols, there's a sort of essentially a cheap talk phase where players talk to each other and then they stop and then they make a decision. But that just doesn't seem realistic. Um, asynchrony is a common feature in many real world applications. In distributed computing, asynchrony is a standard assumption. In an asynchronous system, there's no upper bound on the running time. Uh, sorry, no upper bound on how long it'll take a message to get delivered. Message could, messages might never be delivered. My point is that, that markets are much closer to being asynchronous than synchronous. It's not like there's a clock ticking and the trade gets executed the round after you sent it. Blockchain assumes partial synchrony. So the standard assumption of blockchain is that anytime I send a message, there's an upper bound of delta and messages arrive within delta steps. That's the canonical blockchain model. Now, partial synchrony is, as the name suggests, somewhere between synchrony and asynchrony. It was introduced in part to get around the known problems with Byzantine agreement and asynchronous settings. But I should point out the partial synchrony, many of the issues that arise uh, in dealing with asynchrony already arise with partial synchrony. For example, you might have, a, with partial synchrony, it could be uh, all the good guys send messages and the bad guys get the message. So in partial synchrony, typically we sort of group things into rounds, but now the rounds sort of last delta steps, because it can take up to delta steps for a message to arise, to arrive. But then if I send a message, if I'm a good guy, I send a message, uh, it could be that the bad guys, so in round K, all the good guys send a message and it could be their messages are received by the bad guys before they send their message. And what that means is that, that with partial synchrony, the bad guys have a major advantage. They can decide what to do in the kth round as a function of what the good guys did in the kth round because um, they'll, they might know what the good guys did. And you have to deal with that. So this is, um, so even with partial synchrony, there are serious problems. So it turns out that, that, that um, we wanted to get the same results in asynchronous systems or the same kinds of results in asynchronous systems so he wanted to say, well, if you can do something with a mediator in an asynchronous system, then you can do the same thing without the mediator. Well, even making that precise was a bit tricky because in an asynchronous system, the outcome that you get might depend on the scheduler. So the scheduler, you can think of the scheduler as just another player that decides who moves and how long messages are going to take to arrive. Right, so in an asynchronous system, um, players are scheduled. That's why we call it a scheduler. So I can decide, okay, at this step, Rupak moves, then at the next step, Rajiv moves, then the people here, Anna moves later. And that message that Rajiv sent to me, it'll take five rounds to arrive. That's what the scheduler, so to speak, decides. And typically when you wanna prove their protocol is correct in an asynchronous system, you have to prove that it's correct no matter what the scheduler does, no matter what order players are scheduled in, and no matter how long it takes for messages to arrive. Now, sometimes you can simplify that. You can say, well, I want a scheduler that's fair, that you, know, you don't have to wait too long. If you want to send a message, 
you won't be delayed arbitrarily. Um, so we can put restrictions on the scheduler, but that's the kind of thing we have to worry about in asynchronous systems. The point is when we're thinking game theoretically and you're playing, let's say, even with a mediator, the equilibrium you end up playing might depend on the scheduler. That is, the mediator could say, well, let me wait for messages. If I get a message from, from Rupak before I get a message from Rajiv, then I'll go for this equilibrium. And if I get the message from Rajiv first, I'll go for that equilibrium. It's actually not too hard to get examples like that. So in the synchronous setting, implementing a mediator said meant that if you got a certain Nash equilibrium with the mediator, you got the same Nash equilibrium without the mediator. But now in the asynchronous setting, the equilibrium that you get might depend on the scheduler. So what we require is that for every scheduler in the mediator game, if you look at the equilibrium you get, there's a scheduler in the communication game that gives you the same equilibrium and vice versa. So that the set of equilibria that you get with the mediator game, um, you get the same set in the communication game, the cheek talk game. Um, and it, it's a question of for every scheduler here, there's a scheduler here that gives the same result. I hope that makes sense if uh, not ask questions, but with that caveat, uh, we were able to prove similar results. This is just last year, so these are fairly recent results that, that um, if you have a K2 robust equilibrium using a mediator, then you can implement it now before the results said if N is greater than three K plus three T, that three now went up to a four. So if N is greater than four K plus T, uh, and now if you have a punishment strategy, you can do better, you can get that to three K plus four T before it was two K plus three T. So basically um, the numbers increased by one to deal with asynchrony and there's matching lower bands. So, sorry, there's a question. So is there a yeah. simple correspondence between the schedules in the game with the mediator and in the game? Without? No, no. Um, the schedules are much more complicated because if you think about it in the game with the scheduler, so uh, sorry, in the game with the mediator, typically the protocol, the protocols that we're looking at typically are very simple, right? Everybody sends a message to the mediator. The mediator does stuff, tells everybody what to do. And in fact, you can show without loss of generality, you can reduce to these, um, to protocols where everybody just sends one message to the mediator, the mediator figures something out and sends one message back to the players. Uh, so there isn't much scope for the scheduler in that setting. The scheduler can of course decide what order the mediator will get messages in, but only once. Um, and it can decide what order the mediator's messages are going to arrive to various players, uh, but not a lot of room to maneuver. Whereas in the communication game, the communication game, everybody is sending everybody else messages. So the scheduler has lots of room to maneuver. It's very, very different kind of schedule. So there's no easy mapping from what the schedule in the mediator game looks like to what the scheduler in the cheap talk game looks like. Other uh, questions? I have, I have a question, but in the asynchronous setting with uh, scheduler, how do you define equilibrium? Like who this in terms of the scheduler's uh, strategy? Uh, so we don't view the scheduler as a strategic player. That is, the scheduler doesn't have payoffs. So it's once we fix the scheduler, that's an equilibrium, right? That um, that it's it's it would be different if we view the scheduler as a player in the game, and and they would be part of the equilibrium. They're not. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but if 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 even in the two player setting, if one player and and there is a scheduler, but yeah. if I deviate, uh, you know, then the schedule the scheduler has to pick a different schedule because maybe the messages I send. So we we think of the scheduler as following a strategy. That's a fair question. Um, think of the scheduler as following a strategy. That that so actually we do even more. Um, we're assuming that the scheduler is an adversary. So that when we say um, that there's an equilibrium, it's an equilibrium even if the scheduler is out to get you, so to speak. So that that um, uh, so in a sense, yes. They, they, if you send a different message, I have to decide for that message how long is it going to take, 
and and the answer is okay the scheduler is on your side and 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 it has to be an equilibrium even if the scheduler so to speak cooperates with you and delays the message as you wish it to be delayed so it's a very strong notion of equilibrium okay. but one that i think consistent um with what's done in the distributed computing literature where the scheduler is viewed as an adversary and notice that this is an if then result so we're saying for each scheduler in the mediator game if there's a scheduler so to speak if if there's a scheduler if there's an equilibrium with the scheduler cooperates with the deviating players then there's an equilibrium in the communication game where again the scheduler cooperates with the deviating players so we're you know the scheduler is part of the adversary on both sides of, of the equation other questions Uh, so there's tons of related work on implementation of both CS and game theory, and there's been a lot of work in the CS community since our paper came out. A lot of people pushed these results, but I want to focus on some results that are wrong <laughs> in the game theory literature. Um, so as I say, that going back to what I find amazing is that the work in the game theory literature, uh, where they prove that, that we can implement equilibria if n is greater than or equal to 4, so that's just theorem 1a with k equal 1. I mentioned that before. This goes back to Forge and Barney. Roger Meyerson was involved. And Roger Meyerson won a Nobel Prize. And Francois Forge is a very well-known game theorist. Uh, Barney is a sort of an OR game theory guy, also very well-known. So my point here, these are not obscure papers in an obscure corner of, of game theory. These are, you know, the people involved in this literature were, were extremely well-known people. And similarly in the computer science literature, and again, look at the dates, 88. Um, this is Ben Orr, Goldreich and Victorson. Uh, this is Shaum, Kreppel and, and Damgaard. But people like, you know, the people involved in multi-party computation, people like Avi Victorson, Mickey Ben Orr, Silvio Macali, Shafi Goldwasser, Odette Goldreich, these are major figures in computer science. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, that, that by, looking at a result of Ben Orgold, ben Orgold Reich and Victorson, um, where they proved that you could, you could implement a, 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 a trusted third party if n is greater than 3t. It was basically the core of our proof for theorem 1a. Uh, theorem 1a is this one, the n, whoops, the if n is greater than 3k plus 3t, we can implement the mediator. We were just, I mean, it was not completely trivial, but the core of our proof was, was, was the BGW proof. Um, now, in the game theory literature, um, uh, Elhanan ben Porat proved theorem 1b with k equals 1. Um, again, uh, that's what the game theory literature was interested in, k is 1, t is 0. So he proved that if n is greater than, um, sorry, if n is greater than 3, n is greater than 2 times 1, uh, and there is a punishment strategy then you can implement a mediator. Uh, at least he claimed to prove that. Uh, it turns out that there's a problem with his proof. His proof is bounded. Uh, his strategy is bounded. That is, you don't have to understand anything about game theory. You look at his proof and he says, this proof, here it is, it's going to run in 17 steps. I mean, it's not 17, but basically the, the players go through rounds and after four rounds where each player plays once, so it's basically four n rounds, uh, the protocol stops. So it's a bounded protocol. You don't have to understand anything about the details of his protocol. If you just look at the structure of his argument, it says, here is my protocol, it's bounded. Well, we have a theorem that says, this was the point of theorem three, uh, there is no bounded protocol. You can't implement a KT robust strategy with a mediator using cheap talk with expected running time less than or equal to b if 2k plus 2t is greater than or equal to n. Uh, you can't do it. So we knew that his theorem had to be wrong. Uh, then later after that, we found the bug. So there is a bug and we, uh, you know, I, I know Elhanan reasonably well. I pointed out the bug. He, he's written a, an erratum where he has a much stronger assumption that, um, and he proves his, his result is correct under this much stronger assumption. But the interesting thing is, we knew there had to be a bug even before we read the details of his proof. Because, you know, just sort of 
glaringly obvious that, that his protocol is bounded. Um, so as I say, he has a correction using a notion of verifiability that, that isn't implementable. Um, there are results by Hello that, that extends Ben Porat. Once he saw our work, he said, ah, it's good to think about K-resilience, but he too had some problems in his proof. Um, there's work in the CS literature that, that gave us theorem 1C. 1C is this one that, that where you had one-way functions existing again in the case the K plus one. Since then, there's been a lot more work in the CS literature generalizing these results. Now again, Urbana Villa, um, these are two people, um, had a paper where they got theorem 1D. What's 1D? I got. Um, right, this one. That, that um, if one-way functions exist, then K plus T, uh, if N is greater than K plus T, then there is an implementation. But again, their results assumed uh, they had a bounded protocol. Again, you don't have to understand anything about what they're doing, but you can look at their protocol and see it runs in a bounded number of steps. And our theorem showed that that's false. And again, after we figured out it had to be false, it took us a while, uh, but we found the bug in their protocol. Their protocol got published in, their paper got published in Econometrica, which is arguably the leading journal in the field. And, and Ben Poitz was in JET, which is Journal of Economic Theory, another major journal in the field. So again, this stuff wasn't in obscure journals. And I find it fascinating sociologically that, you know, arguably if you look at notions like multi-party computation and implementing mediators, both of which, you know, late 80s in economics and, and computer science, um, so these, no, these guys went on for two decades, basically. Actually, our, our first paper came out in 2006. So for about 16 years, blissfully unaware of the other side's work, right? Even though they were doing, you know, more or less the same problem. And as I say, the CS techniques very much apply to the problems that, that, that the game theorists looked at. So there's other work. And as I say, since our original paper, there's been literally hundreds of papers written on this. Um, so let me stop and say that issues of coalitions and fault tolerance are critical in distributed computing and game theory and cryptography. I think by combining ideas from all three areas, we can get lots of insights. I, I think in particular, game theory has not looked at asynchronous systems. My own feeling is really there's like one or two papers in the game theory literature that look at asynchrony. It's a major topic in computer science and distributed computing. I think there's a lot more that can be done in game theory if you consider um, asynchronous settings, which I think really, you know, lots of real world settings that they apply. Um, now, I think now there are a lot of papers that have considered rational players as well as Byzantine players in the distributed computing literature. Um, Lorenzo Elvisi and his students pushed another topic, which I think is really interesting. He says, look, in the real world, you have a certain number of people who will follow the protocol if you tell them to do so. Think of them as being, they use the word altruistic, I prefer the word obedient, but basically, if I tell you, you know, you should pay taxes, turns out that at least in the States, most people pay taxes, or they don't cheat very much. Um, in Greece, nobody pays taxes. So uh, Lorenzo wanted to look at a notion where he said, well, suppose a certain number of players are guaranteed are going to follow the protocol. So it's another parameter, just like we had saying that most T players are going to deviate, um, and most K players are, are, are rational, they might form a coalition. Now we allow for, you know, I'm going to guarantee you that a certain number of players are guaranteed to follow the protocol. They're going to be obedient. Um, and it turns out that, you know, maybe you can take advantage of that, that, that knowing that a certain number of players will do what they're supposed to do, uh, that can be something a mechanism designer can, can, you know, use to design a better mechanism. Um, there hasn't been very much work on that, but I actually think that's, that's a really interesting area. Actually, I'd like to push it a bit to say that I will follow the protocol as long as I don't feel like a total jerk when I do so. So if I, 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 this is the example in Greece. I think in Greece, nobody pays taxes because they figure nobody else is paying taxes. So why should I pay taxes when nobody else is paying taxes? 
Whereas in the States, people tend to, I mean, they've done studies, a lot more people pay taxes, I think partly because they're assuming that most other people are paying taxes. So what I'd like to have to consider, and, and it'd be interesting to make this precise, a notion of conditional obedience, where you follow the protocol as long as you don't feel like you're being taken advantage of. And I think it'd be really interesting to study that. Um, so we have implications for game theory. So I, I've used up my time. I mean, I, I could spend a few minutes talking about the structure of the proof if people want. I'd be happy to answer more detailed questions. So pretty much up to you, or I'm happy to also quit. It's one o'clock, so I don't know how, how things work. Uh, Rupak, it looks like you want to talk, but you're muted. Yeah, so um, maybe at this point we can take questions. And uh, if there are questions about the proof, we visit that during the okay. discussion. And thank you very much. This was a really fascinating uh, talk. Welcome. So uh, if you want to ask questions, please uh, write something in the chat and I can call upon you. Or you can just unmute yourself. And no, uh, no, I mean, at least the physical audience doesn't seem to be too large. So yeah. Um, perhaps I can start with a very quick question. Sure. Um, so your games are eventually one shot. So what is the meaning of a punishment strategy? Uh, uh, this then? is a punishment. So um, the underlying game is one shot, yes. But the communication game is very much not one shot. That, that, oh, uh, it's an extensive form game. I so see. so there, it, it literally a punishment strategy. If I catch you cheating, I will punish you, right? I will play a strategy that, that guarantees that you get a worse payoff than you would have gotten had you not cheated. So it, it, it's, um, yeah, so it, it, it's important that, that our communication games are, are extensive form games. They're not one-shot games. Okay, thank you. I, I also had a short question about the punishment. So is the sure. punishment strategy, uh, th does it influence anything or any punishment strategy? Just the, uh, the, the fact that you will be caught. I'm, let me try to answer. I'm not sure I understood the question. So I'll try and if I haven't answered the question, ask again. <laughs> okay. um, that that it literally is um if i catch you cheating it's a strategy that i can implement that results in you getting a worse payoff than you would have gotten otherwise it does influence things so basically um so the, here's the way to think about it. Uh, i can it turns out that i can i can tune a parameter to say how likely is it that, that i'll be able to catch you if you deviate so let's say, you know, with probably one third, I'll catch you if you deviate. Well, then I just make sure the punishment strategy is such that the amount, you know, with probably one third, uh, I catch you and then I'll invoke the punishment strategy. And so your expected payoff is well, a third of the time you'll get punished, two thirds of the time you might make out like a bandit because you didn't get caught. And I want it to be the case that, that um, uh, you'll end up worse, you know, so you'll decide it's just a bad idea to deviate because of the probability of getting caught. Uh, so I, it turns out that I can tune the parameters. So as long as there's any kind of a punishment strategy, even if the punishment strategy even makes you epsilon worse off, uh, it's the threat that I can invoke it that keeps you on the straight and narrow. So in equilibrium, I actually don't play the punishment strategy, right? This is like, you know, if you have kids, it's like this threat that if you do this, you will get the severe punishment and the kids don't do it. And you never have to invoke the punishment strategy, but knowing that it's there is important. It prevents them from deviating, right? So. Okay, okay. Yeah, th that explains it because I was under the impression that punishment strategy is something that uh, is part of the game already. Well, it, it, it exists. So, I mean, yeah. that is, it, there, there's some, you know, in other words, you imagine you tell a kid that, you know, if, if I catch you cheating, you know, I won't let you play on the computer for a whole week. And that's a horrible punishment. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, if it's, it's such a bad punishment that, that, you know, the child might, might never deviate, might, you know, never be bad because they don't want to get punished, right? So, and that's what in equilibrium, you don't play the punishment strategy. Mm -hmm. It's enough of a threat that, that, that you don't have to invoke it, but it's important that, that it's possible to invoke it, right? In, in the same sense as, you know, you can imagine with kids that, you know, there's no way you can prevent me from playing on the computer because, um, you know, I can get it to, from my cell phone or something, you know, I, right. So if, if the fact that you 
if you know about sequential equilibrium, there is a concern very much, if you're, if you're a parent, you know that, that you, know, you can threaten something, will you actually carry out the punishment if, if you have to, right? Um, and uh, the, so is it, if you're in the situation that you're not supposed to get to where, where there's a deviation and you catch it, will you carry out the punishment strategy? Because the punishment strategy will also make you worse off. And what we've shown is that there, you can actually implement a sequential equilibrium where um, it's rational to carry out the punishment um, if, you know, if, if you're in a position where you have to. So uh, that's a stronger notion of equilibrium than Nash equilibrium, it's a sequential equilibrium, but we, we can actually implement the sequential equilibrium as well. So has that answered the question? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, other questions? And Neil? So, um, Paula Kupferman presented, may, maybe in this seminar or in the other one, uh, sort of the model checking question when it has to do with Nash equilibrium and sort of uh, K Nash equilibrium. So, mm -hmm. does does the model checking question for KT robust equilibrium make sense? Or do I not understand I, I, something fundamental? It's a good question. I so how did Ona model the um, model checking problem? Well, the, the results that you presented uh, are, you know, in general, if I give you a, you know any type of game with a moderator, I can convert. Or there exists a game that for which it doesn't work. Right, but right, the, right. the model checking question would be. Consider this particular game, these particular mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. objectives, and then we need to analyze it, and we need to say for this particular game, it doesn't yeah, hold. Yeah, so it seems to me it doesn't hold. So the question is, which game you'd want to analyze? So I guess it would. I mean, certainly would be very interesting to, you know, we presented an implementation, right? So what's our implementation? It's a strategy. It's a protocol that we claim implements the media. Um, we believe that our protocol is correct. We certainly tried to check the proof very carefully, but we certainly did not run a model checker on it. Um, so you could say that, that um, could we take our, so the interesting protocol would be not, typically the, the protocol with the mediators is, is fairly simple. Um, the hard part is the implementation and, and you know, when the players are just talking to each other. So it certainly makes sense to ask is the, um, is our implementation correct? Is, is, do we in fact have uh, a KT robust protocol without the mediator that gets the same equilibrium that you got with the mediator? Now to make sense out of that, I think you'd need, well, which I assume Ona did as well, you'd need to bring in utilities, right? Because uh, you know, things like punishment strategies are you know, not meaningful if you can't talk about utilities. But it seems to me in principle, once you had a sufficiently rich specification language that could talk about utilities, you could, at least in principle, model check that um, our implementation and, and, and hopefully show that, that it really does implement the Nash equilibrium that we claim it does, right? So that, you know, we have the Nash equilibrium with the mediator. So that would be your spec, right? Do you get this Nash equilibrium in the communication game where the players are just talking to each other without a mediator, um, prove that the strategy, which is fairly common, I mean, the strategy involves um, sort of like a multi-party computation where we're simulating step-by-step step what the mediator is doing while preserving secrecy. Um, so we're using techniques from cryptography to, to literally the players on their own are, are simulating the mediator. That's, that's what happens in, in our communication game. So I, I would think that, that verifying that, that our strategy that simulates the mediator is indeed doing what we claim it does um, would be non-trivial and, and certainly, at least in principle, something you could try to verify. Is that? Neil, I, I'm not sure that I asked the right question. But, okay, uh, try again. Thank you, and I think, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was great. Um, other questions? There's a question from Saleh. 
Okay. Uh, I think you should be able to unmute yourself and ask yeah. the question directly. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, if not, maybe I can just uh, read it out for you. So hi, Joe, great talk. Could you elaborate a bit more on partial synchrony as for example, assumed in blockchain uh, paradigms? How partial is partial synchrony without turning to being asynchronous? So the big difference, so in partial synchrony, there's assumed to be a commonly known upper bound on message delivery time. So if I send a message to Rupak, so suppose the upper bound is seven, it's guaranteed that it will get there within seven rounds. So there's assumed in the background to be a, a clock that's, you know, we can talk about round one, round two, round three, round four. Every message is guaranteed to, to arrive within seven rounds. Could be less. And that's the problem. That um, if some messages arrive quickly, then I might, you know, it might be a good strategy for me to wait before sending my messages to see if I can get some messages that arrive quickly, and then my message can depend on those messages, right? So that, that's called a rushing adversary in, in, in the literature. And that's the kind of thing that the people doing blockchain are very worried about. So obviously, if you can do something in an asynchronous setting, it's guaranteed to work in a partially synchronous setting. So... So that's, that's the key difference. There's an upper bound of message delivery time. And um, I think it's assumed typically that, that if you want to send a message, you can, so that there's no scheduler deciding who gets to send a message when, as there would be in, a, in an asynchronous setting. But as I say, the, just the fact that messages can take up the delta to arrive and that some can arrive earlier than others. So if all messages took exactly seven rounds to arrive, then you might as well be in the synchronous setting, right? Then, then replace seven, you know, call a seven round block one round, one super round, and, and you're back in the synchronous setting, right? So what makes it complicated is that some messages might arrive faster than others, and an adversary can take advantage of the fact that the messages have arrived early. And that turns out to be quite difficult and subtle to deal with sometimes, and as I say, obviously any algorithm that works in the asynchronous setting is guaranteed to work in the partially synchronous setting as well. So, um, you know, one way of just dealing with it is, is just to get an algorithm that works even in the asynchronous setting. So Sada, does that address your question? Thanks. Maybe I have one more question. So you talked about uh, obedient players but I guess you can also model a certain class of players who are unaware of the rules of the game. So the kind of yes. examples that you had about irrationality was about unawareness of the... That's, that can certainly be one interpretation of unawareness, of, 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 of irrationality. That, that, uh, an example I often give um, is, you know, imagine my mother trying to bid on eBay. My mother was hopeless on the internet, never really learned how to use a computer. Um, so you can imagine somebody who, you know, just really doesn't understand the rules of the game at all and is unaware of the rules of the game. So you do have to assume that they understand at least what actions are possible, but um, they may have no clue of what they're supposed to do. Or uh, I think that's very much the case. So again, it seems to me if I was building something like, you know, a bidding system like eBay where there can be thousands of players, you need to build in a certain amount of robustness. You can't assume that everybody you know, using the protocol as an expert so that, you know, sometimes the actions that you're seeing are not rational deviations. It's not that somebody's been sitting there saying, okay, what can I do to get an extra dollar? It's that somebody's sitting there saying, uh, I have no clue of what to do. So I'm going to do this not because I'm trying to get an extra dollar, but, you know, because I really don't understand what's going on. Right, and, and it seems to me that, that if you're a system designer trying to build a large system, you definitely want to build in a certain amount of robustness. Now, I think it's reasonable to assume, and that's why we had the parameters that, look, okay, some people are going to be newbies, some people are going to be clueless, but you know, no more than 10% of the total people using the system are going to be like that. So you, know, you take T to be like 10%, right? Um, that's, that's the idea. 
that that um, and those players, because they're you know don't understand what's going on, they're not doing things for rational reasons. They're not trying to get an extra dollar. Just want to make sure they can't hurt you, right? So that was the motivation for our definition of of robustness or immunity, technically, right? Thank you. So. Okay. Are there any other questions? If not, uh, let me thank uh, Joe from all of us. It's a bit difficult to do it virtually. Yes, yeah, yes, thank I... you again for this uh, yeah. wonderful talk. And, uh, uh, and for the rest of us, uh, we meet again next week uh, okay. at the same time. Thank you again. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Oh, you're more than welcome, Rajiv. Bye bye. Yeah.